Okay. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for staying here. Um, this is the last talk, uh, one of the panel last talks of this uh, conference. So this is um, this is talk is about near optimal ground state preparation uh, by Yu Tong and uh, Ling Ling from Berkeley. And Yu Tong will be presenting. Uh, please go ahead, Yu Tong. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, can, can can you make the slides uh, full screen? Uh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, can you see it in full screen now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, so, this talk will be about near optimal ground state preparation, and I will also be talking about uh, ground energy estimation along the way. So, this talk is based on a joint work with Ling Ling, and the, the paper has already been published on Quantum. Here is the archive number if you want to check it out. Uh, so the problem setup is very simple. We suppose we are given a quantum Hamiltonian of size two to the n times two to the n, and the goal is to find its smallest eigenvalue lambda zero, which we call the ground energy, and the corresponding eigenstate lambda zero, which we call the ground state. So uh, as you can see, this is a very basic problem. However, it is also a very hard one because there is a well-known result that without additional information, the task of finding the ground energy of a K local Hamiltonian is QMA complete. So in order to make this problem tractable, we need to add some assumptions. And the, the first assumption we add is that we assume we are given a circuit UI that prepares an initial state phi zero. And this phi zero has an overlap with the exact ground state psi zero that is lower bounded by a parameter gamma. So this is a highly non-trivial assumption, uh, which we will use in all, all our algorithms. Uh, for our state preparation algorithms, we will need a further assumption, which is that a spectral gap between the uh, ground energy and the first excited state energy uh, is lower bounded by a parameter delta. Uh, so these assumptions are uh, reasonable in many uh, interesting settings. For example, if we consider a quantum chemistry setting, then uh, there is a method called Hartree-Fock method that uh, enables us to uh, prepared, uh, actually it produces a, a approximate ground state in the form of a single Slater determinant. So because it's a single Slater determinant, it can actually be efficiently prepared using a quantum circuit. And it usually have a pretty good overlap with the exact ground state uh, if your system size is not too large. And also we usually have some empirical knowledge of how large, large the spectral gap is uh, either through uh, classical simulation or experiments. So some other ways to uh, construct this UI includes using vari variational algorithms such as variational quantum eigensolver and QAOA and the adiabatic evolution. Uh, so we are certainly not the first uh, ones to consider this problem. Uh, actually the earliest paper I can find is this 1999 paper by Abrams and Lloyd. So uh, basically, uh, the previous works all assume uh, roughly the same Oracle assumptions. Like uh, they assume they have this UI and H is given through the time evolution operator e to the minus I tau H. So the simplest idea is just to perform phase estimation uh, using this time evolution operator on this initial state phi zero. So uh, each time we run phase estimation, when we measure the uh, energy register, we will get an eigenvalue in this register and a corresponding eigenstate in the state register. So uh, because we assume there is an initial overlap, uh, when we perform this measurement, there is basically a uh, gamma, uh, there's basically a gamma squared probability of getting the ground energy and the ground state. Uh, so what we do to prepare the ground state is just we run phase estimation for a total of basically gamma to the minus two times and with high probability, you will get ground energy in the energy register and ground state in the state register. So the query complexity of this approach, if you want to uh, estimate the ground en energy to some precision epsilon, then the query complexity is uh, as follows. Basically, you need epsilon inverse times gamma to the minus two queries to the time evolution operator and gamma to the minus two queries to this uh, Oracle UI. And this 2009, uh, 2019 paper by Gertura and Sirak improved the dependence on gamma to uh, only gamma inverse, but this comes at the expense of a worse dependence on epsilon. 
so if you want to do uh, ground state preparation, then basically you need to first estimate the ground energy to some precision that is roughly the spectral gap and then prepare the ground state. So the dominant cost actually comes from ground, ground energy estimation and the quarry complexity is obtained by just replacing old epsilon we have discussed before by this delta. Uh, so in this talk, I will be presenting three algorithms. Uh, the first one, I will talk about how to prepare the ground state when we have a sufficiently tight upper bound of the ground energy. So this, in the second algorithm, we estimate the ground energy. In the third algorithm, we uh, combine the previous two algorithms uh, to prepare the ground state without knowing uh, this upper bound needed in the first algorithm. So what we do in the third algorithm is basically we first estimate the ground energy to sufficient precision. This enables us to find the upper bound that, it, that can be used in the first algorithm. Then we apply the first algorithm to uh, prepare the ground state. Uh, and then uh, I will show you that actually the uh, quarry complexity of the first and the third algorithms, uh, although they assume a different prior knowledge, the complexities are basically the same and they have near optimal dependence on the parameters gamma and the delta. Uh, and compared to previous algorithms, we mostly improve in terms of ground energy estimation. So this will be our main result. Uh, so for ground energy estimation, we assume this, uh, uh, we assume access to this Oracle UI and H is given through a unitary UH that block encodes H. So we call UH a block encoding of H. And this is a little different from the assumptions in previous works because uh, like they assume access to this time evolution operator. But later I will explain that these two assumptions are actually equivalent. So we still need this overlap assumption and the goal is to estimate the ground energy to within additive error epsilon. There will be some error probability and we want to control it below a threshold data. So our result is that we can do this uh, by using uh, basically gamma inverse times epsilon inverse queries to UH and gamma inverse queries to UI. So this is query complexity. The gate complexity is roughly the same. Uh, so to get some sense of like whether this result is good or bad, we compared it with previous works. So in previous work uh, for phase estimation, they have a, a nice dependence on the precision epsilon, but depending on gamma is not so good. Uh, in this GTC paper, they have a nice dependence on gamma. Uh, while in our work, we have both the good dependence on epsilon and the good dependence on gamma. Uh, so gamma is the initial overlap, epsilon is the precision. Uh, and therefore we say we get the best of both worlds. So in, in uh, ground state preparation, the situation is similar. Basically, we get a good dependence on the spectral gap delta and the good dependence on the overlap gamma. And, and then uh, later I will show that dependence on gamma and the delta are optimal. So uh, here H uh, or Hamiltonian is given through a block encoding. I will explain what block encoding means. Basically, if you have a matrix A, this is an uh, arbitrary matrix, uh, you cannot really expect to represent it using a unitary circuit because it might not be unitary. So the thing we do is that we try to find a larger unitary uh, and uh, put A inside a block of this larger unitary. Uh, and you might need to rescale A because it might have a, a operator norm greater than one. So if this relation holds, we say that U is a block encoding of A. Uh, once we have this block encoding, we can do many interesting things. For example, we can uh, just apply it to a quantum state phi with m and zero qubits prepared in zero state. And what we get out of it uh, is uh, first we have a part we want, and then there's a perpendicular part that we do not want, and there is some error. So this part we want can be isolated by just measuring the m and zero qubits. And if you get O0 outcome, uh, in your state register, you will basically have this state A acting on phi after some normalization. So many matrices of practical interest can be efficiently block encoded, such as K-local Hamiltonians, sparse matrices, second quantized fermionic Hamiltonians, etc. cetera. Uh, so this concept was first proposed in this Hamiltonian simulation by cubitization paper by Lo and Chuang. It was called standard form at the beginning, but it seems later block encoding became a more popular name. So a very important tool we'll be using is called quantum singular value transformation uh, introduced in, in these two papers. 
Uh, so what it does, uh, we only consider the simple case where A is that when A is given through a blocking coding UA, then QSBT enables us to blocking code uh, P of A or alpha. So this is basically just a polynomial eigenvalue transformation acting on A. The P here is a polynomial. So if P has degree D, then the total number of queries to UA needed is D. So the cost is basically determined by this polynomial degree. And uh, this enables us to uh, prepare a state P uh, of A or alpha acting on uh, like any initial, initial state phi. So we can use this to do many things such as uh, if, we, uh, if we let P of X uh, approximate the inverse function X inverse, then P A or alpha acting on phi will basically just gives us uh, A inverse phi. Right, so this enables us to solve the quantum linear system problem. And similarly, we can prepare, uh, prepare the Gibbs state and perform Hamiltonian simulation and do many interesting things with this method. So uh, these things are discussed in detail in this paper by Gideon, Sulo, and Wip. Uh, and another thing it can do is that when coupled with amplitude estimation, we can estimate the amplitude of this, uh, this thing. So this is what we'll be going to do in, in this talk. And uh, as I mentioned before, having access to UH is actually equivalent to having access to the time revolution operator. Here's why. Uh, first, if we have UH, we can get U through Hamiltonian simulation. So uh, in a previous talk, Yuan Su has already uh, discussed this in detail. And actually, if we have access to this U, we can recover a blocking coding of H through a quantum singular value transformation. And this is a theorem in this, uh, this GSLW paper. So now we have all the tools available. Uh, here I'll present the first algorithm. Uh, so we assume we have an upper bound of the ground energy lambda zero, and this upper bound we denote by mu. So this mu needs to be tight enough and needs to uh, be between this ground energy and the first excited state energy. So this is a, a pretty strong assumption and we will get rid of it later on. Uh, and the main idea is to construct approximate projection operator using QSVT to filter out the unwanted eigenstates. So this procedure we call eigenstate filtering. Uh, so we need a filter polynomial, uh, P of X, satisfying uh, the conditions that it takes value between zero and one for all X between plus and minus one. It takes value uh, very close to one when X is sufficiently negative. It takes value uh, very close to zero when X is sufficiently positive. And there's an interval between plus and minus uh, delta in which it transitions from one to zero. So for a polynomial to satisfy all these things, the degree will need to scale uh, linearly with respect to delta inverse. So uh, this is how this polynomial roughly looks like. Uh, so this, this blue line. And uh, once we have this polynomial, we can shift it by mu so that the uh, ground energy of the Hamiltonian here is mapped into one and the rest of spectrum is mapped into zero. So when we apply uh, this shifted polynomial we denote by F. So when we apply F of X to H through QSVT, what we get is nothing other than a projection operator. So this whole thing is a approximate projection operator into the ground state psi zero. And, and then we apply it to the initial state B zero uh, because phi zero has some overlap with psi zero, uh, this will give us, give us uh, something very close to the ground state. And the query complexity is that we need gamma inverse times delta inverse queries to UH and gamma inverse queries to UI. The gamma inverse dependence comes from amplitude amplification and delta inverse dependence comes from the polynomial degree. And this requires knowledge of mu and delta. For delta, there isn't much we can do for, uh, but for mu, I will uh, talk about how to get rid of it through, eigen, uh, through this ground energy estimation. So this will be our second algorithm uh, in which we estimate the ground energy. The main strategy is to reduce it to a bunch of decision problems. Uh, so the decision problem is as follows. Uh, suppose we are given a pair of values A and B such that they sandwich this ground energy lambda zero. So we divide A and B the interval between A and B into three equal parts. In the first part, we are, sorry, 
in the first part, we are required to output zero. Uh, in the second part, we are allowed to output anything we want. In the third part, we are required to output one. So if we are, do able, uh, if we are able to do this, then depending on the outcome, we can decide where this lambda zero is. Because if the, uh, is, if the output is zero, then we know lambda zero must be in these first two parts. If the output is one, it must be in these uh, last two parts. So uh, therefore the idea uh, is that if the decision problem can be solved and we can start with a pair of A and B that, uh, such that they sandwich this lambda zero and repeatedly solve the decision problem. If each time we solve it, if the output is zero, uh, it tells us that lambda zero must be between A and one third A plus two thirds B. So uh, next we can just update B to be, to be this value. Uh, and if the output is one, similarly we can up update A. So each time we solve this decision problem, we will end up with a new pair of A and B such that they sandwich this ground energy lambda zero. And the distance between A and B will be shrinking uh, exponentially. So we can just do this iteratively until the distance between A and B is below or allowed error. Uh, therefore, uh, we can estimate ground energy to uh, arbitrary precision just by repeatedly solving this decision problem. And this decision problem is solved through this eigenstate filtering procedure we presented in the first algorithm. So here I'll illustrate how it is done. We start with some A and B, and this interval is uh, divided into three equal parts. Uh, if lambda zero is in the first part, then this filter polynomial will map the ground energy to one. Uh, we don't care about how it maps, uh, like where it maps the, the rest of the spectrum to, but uh, only uh, we only care about this ground energy. And the amplitude here, because phi zero has a, has a ground state component uh, whose amplitude is lower bounded by gamma in our assumption. Uh, so this whole amplitude will be essentially lower bounded by gamma because the ground state component is preserved in this mapping. Therefore, uh, this amplitude will be large in the first case. In the second case, uh, when lambda zero is in the second interval, uh, because there is some degree of free, uh, there is some freedom we can use in the uh, decision problem in which uh, like anything we output in this scenario is correct. So we, we just don't need to worry about uh, this situation. So in the third case, when lambda zero is in the third part, then all the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian is, are mapped to zero. So this amplitude will be very small. Uh, therefore, in order to correctly solve the decision problem, the only thing we need to do is to distinguish between the case in which this amplitude is uh, like essentially lower bound by gamma or the amplitude is like essentially zero. So there is a gap of order gamma between the two cases. And therefore the two cases can be uh, distinguished by just running amplitude estimation to precision uh, of order gamma. So this comes with a, a gamma inverse overhead. There will be some error probability, but it, it can be exponentially suppressed using majority voting. So here I will demonstrate how this whole process is done. So here we start with a pair of A and B. This red line uh, is where the ground energy is. So we solve the decision problem. It tells us to throw away part of the interval. And we solve it again, throw so away part of the interval again. And then we just repeat this until A and B are close enough so that we get uh, the precision we want. The query complexity is that each step we need uh, gamma inverse number of cores to ui and the delta inverse gamma inverse number of cores to uh. This delta is proportional to the distance between a and b, will, which will be shrinking exponentially until it reaches epsilon. So the total complexity is just, we sum up the complexity in each step. And uh, the total number of cores to ui is gamma inverse. Total number of cores to uh is epsilon inverse times gamma inverse. This, so this proves or uh, or main result for ground energy estimation. Uh, now we use this to do ground state preparation. So here we no longer assume that we have this mu. Instead, we need a weaker, we only need a weaker assumption that there is a spectral gap separating uh, lambda zero and lambda one. 
uh, we still need the overlap assumption. And what we do is that we first estimate the ground energy to precision delta over four. And this estimate we denote by lambda zero prime. And then we find a mu uh, through this lambda zero prime. And uh, this mu will satisfy uh, these inequalities. Uh, so this will enable us to apply the eigenstate filtering in the first algorithm to prepare the ground state. So basically we estimate the ground energy, which gives us a mu. And then we use this mu to uh, prepare the ground state. So this is our third algorithm. Uh, the complexity is obtained by just replacing the uh, epsilon in the previous algorithm with uh, the spectral gap delta. And the next I will show uh, that the dependence on gamma here and dependence on delta here, uh, they are both optimal. So this is done by looking at the unstructured search problem in which we are asked to search uh, among all n-based strings for an element w. So this w is marked by an oracle uw, which when acting on any base string x gives you x, except when x is equal to w, in which case it, it gives you minus w. So the famous BBBV theorem tells us that this problem cannot be solved with small o square root of n is to UW. And we observed that this is actually a ground state preparation problem because uh, like if you look uh, look at this thing as a Hamiltonian because it's, it's Hermitian and uh, the ground state is nothing other than just W and the corresponding ground energy is minus one. So here we formulate uh, this problem in our framework. Uh, the Hamiltonian H is just UW because UW is also a unitary so it is a block encoding of itself. So here UH is also UW. For initial state phi zero, we choose it to be the uniform superposition of all bit strings, which we denote by U. And this can be efficiently prepared by just applying a hard mode transform. Uh, the uh, overlap gamma is one over square root of N. This can be directly computed. And the spectral gap is two because UW only ha has uh, two eigenvalues plus and minus one. So suppose there exists an algorithm that given delta lower bounded by some constant prepares the ground state with small o, uh, small o gamma inverse queries to UH. We just apply this algorithm to solve this particular ground state preparation problem. And therefore it can solve the unstructured search problem with small o square root of n queries to UW. So this is impossible. So uh, this shows that uh, or dependence uh, on gamma is optimal. It's, it's nearly optimal up to some poly, uh, logarithmic factors. So to prove the optimal dependence on the spectral gap delta, we need to create some situation in which the spectral gap is small, but the overlap is large. And this is done by considering a two-step process inspired by this 2002 paper by Charles uh, uh, Dilto, Fari, and Goldstone. So, uh, what we, so the previous uh, example can be considered as going directly from the ground state of this Grover diffusion operator D to the ground state of UW. Uh, there's overlap one over square root of n, the uh, spectral gap is two. Here, uh, instead of going directly from here to here, we add a, something in the middle, which we denote by uh, H, uh, H of T star. So H of T uh, is a linear combination of the Grover diffusion operator and UW. So here we first go from the ground state of D to prepare the ground state of H, uh, H of T star, and then use this as the initial state phi zero to prepare the ground state of UW. So we are solving two ground state preparation problems. Uh, in both problems, the overlap uh, are large, basically one over square root of two. Uh, and the, the spectral gap in the second problem is also large, it's two. The bottleneck is in the uh, spectral gap of the first uh, ground state preparation problem. And the gap here is one over square root of n. So by a similar argument as in the previous one, if there is a algorithm with better dependence on the gap, it will be able to solve the, ground, uh, the unstructured search problem with small o square root of n and query complexity. So this is again impossible and it shows the optimal dependence on the uh, spectral gap. And we can actually create some further trade-off between overlap and gap, uh, gap by shifting this T star from one half to like something slightly to the left. And then we will be able to control the scaling of these two parameters. And uh, this will actually complete our 
uh, proof. There is some details omitted, but the idea is basically uh, as I have discussed. So to summarize the results, first we present an algorithm that prepares the ground state with knowledge of a sufficiently tight upper bound of the uh, ground energy. And this is done through a procedure we call eigenstate filtering. And, uh, and then we uh, discuss how to uh, estimate the ground energy through repeatedly solving a decision problem. Uh, then we combine these two algorithms to present an algorithm that prepares the ground state without knowledge of this upper bound. Uh, and this, uh, this algorithm has a near optimal dependence on the overlap and the spectral gap. So uh, thank you for your attention and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Thank you Yu, for the wonderful talk. So um, there's, there's questions in the Slack channel that has been answered. So let's wait for more questions. So my question is, um, what's the degree of the eigenvalue filter function? Uh, the polynomial. Uh, yeah, so there is a scaling given in the slides. Basically, it's just a. Uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, so basically, it's just uh, this delta inverse times logarithmic uh, epsilon prime inverse. So delta delta is the like basically the gap here. Okay. I see. Uh, yeah. So epsilon is your precision for, for how close yeah. this is to one, how close it is to zero. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There's a follow-up um, of the Slack channel question. So um, Abhinav, uh, Abhinav now, uh, asked, um, and, and what's the, what's the uh, cost from translate, uh, for translating the, the block encoding Hamiltonian to the uh, time evolution operator? And what was the cost for translating back? And Andrew said it's, it's not the unit cost. And then uh, Abnaf asked, so how can we compare the query complexity in this work with the query, query complexity of, of the previous work? Uh, if, if, if it's not constant translation? Yeah, so this is a very good question. But actually, the, like if, if we suppose the uh, spectrum of H is bounded by some constant, uh, then this will be actually a pretty, it's, it, so the tran transition will be pretty low cost because Hamiltonian simulation only comes from, uh, comes with like a logarithmic dependence on the error. And there is a linear dependence on the spectral norm. However, if we assume the spectral norm of H to be constant, then this is just, just gives you a constant overhead, right? So basically- What's the evolution time? The evolution time should also count in the complexity. Uh, yeah, but this tau should be uh, constant as well. Okay. It's, yeah. Because yeah, like sure, uh, in most previous work, they just assume H to have a constant uh, operator norm and tau is just one. Yeah, so this can, yeah, yeah. can be done. That, that, that makes sense. Uh, and the other way uh, there is this procedure, basically you apply arc sign to, to, to the imaginary part of U. Yeah. So it still has a, uh, like a logarithmic dependence on the procedure. Yeah, actually here we use a uh, quantum singular value transformation. However, if you have access to this time evolution operator, what you can do is you just apply the, the, another method called linear combination of unitaries and, and it can give you a similar result. Only, only comes at the expense of like a more Anzilla qubits needed to, to perform this procedure. Yeah. And Yuan, Yuan Su is asking, what do you think would be the potential uh, future direction uh, for ground state preparation? Uh, yeah, so yeah, this is something I meant to talk about, but didn't because of time limit. Uh, so there is this dependence on gamma, which is, uh, so we need to assume there's an initial state phi zero and which has a overlap with the ground state that is lower bound by gamma. So this dependence, uh, although here I prove is optimal, uh, in many practical settings, is, it can be extremely small. For example, if you consider a condensed matter system, so the hartree fock solution can have a like an exponentially small overlap with the uh, exact solution. And this kind of scenario, I'm considering like uh, 
So you cannot just apply this method directly because it will give you a exponential cost. So what I'm considering is that perhaps you can use some quantum embedding method to cut the system into smaller size uh, subsystems and then uh, apply this kind of approach. But this, yeah, so this is certainly something uh, I need, like we need to work, uh, work more on. And another, uh, another uh, potential direction is that here we require knowledge of how, how large this gamma is. So what if we, uh, we only know this gamma is like not too small, but we need to find uh, like, a, we don't have a very precise knowledge of how large it is. So this kind of scenario, I think can be explored further. Okay, sure, thanks. So uh, let's thank all the speakers of this uh, session. The, thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, and also thank all the uh, audience. So I just want to remind, uh, remind everyone that um, you can join the roundtable uh, after the uh, session. And the roundtable round button can be found uh, on the bottom of the, uh, the stage page. And each, each speaker has their own roundtable. So you can join the uh, round, uh, Zoom link to chat with, uh, the, to, to chat with each speaker and ask